Alrighty, hey guys, sorry for the delay. We're having a little bit of a slow morning here at the Bowsbigger household. My son just did not want to sleep last night, but that's okay. We're here now. Um, and I want to do a few things today. So I kind of want to take the pulse, kind of want to get a feel for where you guys are at um, and try to spend a moment filling in gaps anywhere they may be. Because uh, I have gotten a lot of emails saying, you know, can we look at, at problems like this before class or can we look at problems like that before class? Um, and uh, I think it would be good to address those. So let's do a little bit of that today. The other thing I want to do is um, share with you guys some visualization tools to help you better understand what's going on in section 11.2. And, um, and I do also want to convey the main point of section 11.3 today. So it's a bit of a busy day. <clears throat> All right, in order to do any of that, we got to get rolling. So this is MAC. Two, three, one, two. Section 004, the Calc 2 class. And today is the 15th of October, 2021. Today, we are going to work some homework problems. Um, play with Desmos. And introduce section 11.3. All right. Um, so I'm going to do this actually, I guess, a little bit out of order. Um, I'm going to show you guys some stuff in Desmos, which we will come back to and play with a little bit more. Um, and while I do that, I would like you to type into chat the homework problems or topics, things that you want to see discussed a little bit more. Anything that, that you've been feeling a little bit uncomfortable with lately, anything where you feel you need a little more practice or a little more discussion. Um, it could be, you know, sigma notation, limits, sequences, uh, any particular theorem or any particular homework problems, any stuff like that. So just let me know. Let me know in the chat um, where you feel uh, we need to, to spend a little bit more time talking and not not just because you know we haven't done it in class or you feel like you know um, I'm not going to take it like that just just anywhere you feel you would benefit from a little more discussion while that's going on I have something to show you in Desmond okay I'm going to have to play with this for just a second. I want to turn one or two things off. Let's turn this off. <clears throat> for now, let's also turn off the partial syllabus. Okay, so what you're looking at here is an animated graph I put together for graphs of sequences and series. Um, I want to just show you a few graphs of sequences. These are things that we've, we have played with, of course, um, substantially. So here's the graph of like 1 over n. And we know what this looks like. It follows the graph y equals 1 over x. It's just dots along that graph, right? But there are plenty of sequences that are a little bit more complicated. Um, geometric sequences are not super complicated, and they converge so quickly when they converge that the graphs are not super useful to look at. So if I show you the graph of 1 half to the n, you're going to see that this thing tucks down to 0 like right away, and it stays there. So there's not a whole lot of insight to be gained from looking at the graph of a geometric sequence. But some of the other sequences that you guys have had the opportunity to play with, one that we <clears throat> looked at the other day, 1 plus 1 over n all raised to the power of n. I don't think it's immediately obvious that this sequence, or the one that we did, which had a 2 here, um, it's not at all immediately obvious that this is convergent, that the sequence is convergent. But the sequence is. 
and he tends to the number e. The real purpose behind this thing, though, is to show you guys the relationship between the sequence a n and the partial sum s n. So you see here, this is, uh, let me change it to the two. This is the series that we investigated last time. Um, we're looking, the series is sigma a n, where a n is one plus two over n all to the n. So this was that guy, that, that long example that we did last time. And we were able to show that the series here, the full series, the series for which this is the partial sum, <clears throat> diverged using the test for divergence. And you can see that happening here. So the red dots are the partial sums. And you see those just blowing up, getting really, really big as the sequence AM converges to E squared. So I find this kind of interesting. Um, the idea is to help you see the relationship between SM and AM. And in particular, uh, we can look at uh, that test for divergence. So let me. Here's another example where the series would be sigma n plus 1 over n. That sequence a n is convergent. The purple thing here is convergent. And that's the, the limit of the sequence that you're seeing this approach, which is 1. But the partial sums of the series, the things you get when you start adding up all the terms of the sequence, that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So the sequence of partial sums, the red thing, which is the thing that defines the infinite series, that's not convergent. Even though the purple sequence, the sequence of terms, the stuff I'm adding up, is convergent. Some other interesting examples um, come from power functions. So here, I'm summing 1 over the square root of n. My a n's are 1 over n to the 1 half. And you see, again, the purple is going to 0. But what about the red? What is the red doing? It's just growing and growing and growing. It's not 100% clear whether that red is going to blow up to infinity or not. And that's why I include sometimes also this separate thing of a, a log plot. Um, if the orange diverges, then so does the red. But we'll just stick to these for a moment. Now let me try some other numbers here. So like. Here I've got 1 over n to a power that is slightly larger than 1. Of course, the a n's themselves are going to 0, right? 1 over n to any positive power is going to go to 0. And the red now appears to maybe be convergent, right? He's increasing, sure, but he appears to be piling up on something. He's not just blowing up. If I change that power to 0 0.1234, the purple still goes to 0, because that's still a positive power. But now the red is getting bigger and bigger. And what you start to realize is that there's sort of a magical threshold here. If the power of n downstairs is smaller than 1, then the red looks like it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But if the power is bigger than 1, then the red is curving over fast enough that it looks like it might have a horizontal asymptote. Kind of the thing we're discovering here is a theorem uh, related to what are called p-series. And we're going to talk about those a little later. OK. So there are two requests for homework problems. Um, the link to this is in the modules. 
and I invite you guys to play with it. I think if you're looking at a series and you're trying to figure out whether or not that series converges, this tool is a really, really good tool for that. Just type the, the terms of the series in here and then hit play. And you'll be able to look at both the sequence of partial sums and the sequence AN, the stuff you're adding up. We know from the test for divergence that in order for the red to converge, the purple has to go to zero. If the purple doesn't go to zero, the red doesn't stand a chance. But sometimes, even though the purple does go to zero, the red blows up anyway. All right, so let me take a look at those problems you guys requested. Number seven seems to be a hot choice. Uh, what equations? So at the end now, just to respond. Like when we get the the sequence, we have to come up with the equation of the sequence. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like how to find a formula for the nth term? Yeah, formula. Yeah. Sure. All right. So it looks like seven, eight, and nine from this week's homework are ones that we would all like to we would like to look at. Um, certainly. Let me see here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so seven. <clears throat> this actually requires something that we're going to talk about today. Um, I'll go ahead and share it with you. But um, oh, yeah, let's do. Let's do nine first. Nine is going to be the fastest of these. Um, and eight is quite manageable. Seven, I need to share something with you before we can do that. Okay. What number of homework is this? This is homework nine, is it? Homework eight. Okay, we're going to look at homework eight. Question nine. I'm just going to say investigate the series. Sigma n from one to infinity, e to the n over n to the, what was it? Seven, nine, seven. Okay. That's unfortunate. So what is a n here? This series. You do the n or n squared. Um, well, a n is the whole thing inside your sum, right? So it's e to the n over n to the, maybe that looked like a two, sorry, that's a seven. We only have a few tools at this point, right? If the series is geometric, we know what to do. We use our theorem on geometric series. If we think the series might telescope, then we can try writing out the partial sums. Um, but there's no partial fractions to do here. This isn't a rational function. And there's no obvious cancellation term to term. E to the n is always positive. n to the 7 is going to be positive for any positive values of n. And we're running from 1 to infinity. <clears throat> so the only thing that really makes sense to try here is the test for divergence, right? Those are the only things we have for series so far. We have our result on geometric series. We know how to handle telescoping series by writing out the partial sums. And we have the test for divergence. That's it. Everything else we've learned so far in chapter 11 is for sequences, for series. That's all we have so far. And remember what this says. If the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is anything other than zero, then the series sigma n from wherever to infinity, I'll say one, must diverge. <clears throat> so in order to run this test, I'm going to take the limit of the a n's. If that comes out to zero, then the test is inconclusive. But if that comes out to something other than zero, then I know that my series, this series, diverges. 
So let's take a look at that limit. The limit as n goes to infinity of a n here is the limit as n goes to infinity of e to the n over n to the 7. All right, what does the top do as n goes to infinity? Goes to infinity as well. Mm -hmm. Right, e to the n just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, just like e to the x. What about n to the 7? Also goes to infinity. Yeah, so I'm looking at infinity over infinity. Is that equal to one? No, that's indeterminate. Very good. So remember, infinity over infinity, because infinity is not a number, right? The rules for numbers don't apply. Infinity is not a number. You cannot cancel that. Uh, this is what's called an indeterminate ratio, which is the nice kind of indeterminate form. There are indeterminate products, indeterminate differences, indeterminate powers. All of those are harder to handle than indeterminate ratios. The way we handle all of those is by turning them into indeterminate ratios so we can use L'Hopital's rule. <laughs> so because it's an indeterminate ratio, we can use L'Hopital's rule. Uh, some people mentioned that they haven't seen various things in Calc 1, so maybe I'll mention here just in passing. Uh, L'Hopital was a dude. He was a French dude. Um, it's not named after hospitals. It's right. It was a guy. Um, but he didn't come up with this. This is not his theorem. He actually bought this off of one of the Bernoulli brothers, another famous uh, mathematician. Johann Bernoulli was the one who came up with L'Hopital's rule. And then L'Hopital paid him money so that L'Hopital could publish it under his own name. Pretty sketchy shit. Um, in any case, L'Hopital's rule says, if you have an indeterminate ratio, either zero over zero or infinity over infinity, you can take the derivative of the top, the derivative of the bottom, and try again. So here I do have infinity over infinity. So I can use L'Hopital's rule. When I do that, I like to try this LH to indicate we're using L'Hopital's rule in this step. When I do that, I'm taking the derivative of the top, the derivative of e to the n is e to the n, and dividing by the derivative of the bottom, which is 7n to the 6. And now we try again. e to the n still goes to infinity. 7n to the 6 also still goes to infinity. <clears throat> um, so this is, again, an indeterminate ratio. So we would use L'Hopital's rule again. The derivative of e to the n is still e to the n. The derivative of 7n to the 6 is 42n to the 5. And what you notice is that this is still looking like infinity over infinity. Isn't there a way that like, we know e to the n is never going to change? So it's always going to be infinity over something. Good. That's exactly what I was going to say. So at this point, we recognize a pattern. Every time I apply L'Hopital's rule, the top stays the same, and the degree of the bottom goes down by 1, right? 7, 6, 5. So if we do L'Hopital's rule, 5 more L'Hopital rule, then what we'll arrive at is lim n to infinity e to the n over 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. It's 7 factorial times n to the 0. Right, maybe instead of 42, I should write this as 7 times 6 to help you see it. So the next one would be 7 times 6 times 5 n to the 4. And after you differentiate that bottom five more times, you'll have 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 7 factorial. So this is lim n to infinity e to the n over 7 factorial. And 7 factorial is just a number. So this is infinity over 
seven factorial. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't I don't remember what seven factorial is. It's pretty big, um, but it's still finite. And when you divide infinity by a finite number, you get infinity. <clears throat> so the limit of the ans is positive infinity. And I would finish things down here. Remember, you have to be writing in complete sentences. You have to be applying the logic of the theorems. Since the limit as n goes to infinity of the an is positive infinity, which is definitely not zero, the series sigma n from 1 to infinity of a n, which is sigma n from 1 to infinity e to the n over n to the 7, must diverge by the test for divergence. Um, so you want to state the result and uh, refer back to the theorem, because I'm not working directly with the series here. Right? At no point, I have no idea what the series actually looks like. <clears throat> I, haven't, I haven't shown that the partial sums get bigger and bigger and bigger or anything like that. I've indirectly shown that the partial sums get bigger and bigger and bigger by using this theorem, the test for divergence, which says if the ans don't go to zero, then the series sigma an must diverge. Now we can look at this in Desmos, right? And, and if we're ever unsure what's going on, I implore you to take a, take a look at this thing. So e to the n divided by n to the seven. In red, you see your partial sums. Something weird is going on here. Yeah, something ain't right. Hang on. I just graph e to the n. That does what it should. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Yeah, OK. Sorry. So it takes a little while to get going, right? The end of the seven does grow fast at, at first. Okay, that's what's going on here. I'm sorry, I didn't say that right away. End of the seven does start off growing quickly, right? They Remember, they both go to infinity. And e to the zero, e to the one, e to the two, e to the three, those are not huge numbers. And n to the seven is bigger than e to the n at first. But eventually, e to the n takes over. And that will drag, uh, that, will, that will make this whole thing blow up. So let me change my, let's go from one to, say, 100, taking step sizes of one, just for looking at sequences. Here we go. So you see the sequence starts to blow up. And with it, the partial sums must blow up as well. Doesn't do that at first, but it definitely does go there eventually. And you see both of them just blowing up to infinity. Pretty cool, right? Okay. The next one we wanted to look at, <clears throat> we'll get number eight. And uh, maybe in service to this, let's let's play around with this tool in Desmos a little more. So we've got nine over e to the n plus five over n times n plus one. Okay. I actually don't know how this does it. I like the smooth move more. So what do we see here? The sequence AN, the actual terms of the series, that's the purple, is going to zero. And the sequence of partial sums, the red, looks like it's piling up on some number somewhere close to 10. So what do you guys think? Do you think this series converges or diverges? Converge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the series is going to converge. All right. 
Let's do it. The trick here is to use the rules for series that I, I shared with you last time. So 9 over e to the n, 5 over n times epsilon. Where did my series start? One. Mm -hmm. okay. Nine over e to the n, that would be like a multiple of a geometric series. I know how to handle that. Five over n times n plus one looks like something that's ready for some partial fractions. So the very first thing I would do here is split this up. All together, I don't quite know how to handle it. But remember our rules for the sigma operator that we talked about last time. Same as the rules for an integral. Just like you can split integrals up over addition, you can split series up over addition. So this first guy I'm going to handle as a geometric series. The second guy we said is right for some partial fractions. Uh, so we're going to do that partial fractions and then uh, get him moving. Uh, I think that I just got a call from the testing center guys. I'm sorry, I have to deal with this.
Oy vey. All right, I had a student supposed to take a makeup exam today at 1 p.m. Apparently decided to take it at 10 a.m. instead. I'm so sorry about that, guys. I just had to rush to get that stuff set up for him. So coming back here, the trick is to split this up into two different series. Each one of these is something I know how to handle. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to handle this geometric piece, sigma n from 1 to infinity, 9 over e to the n. Can anybody suggest how we can get started with this? What should we do? I can tell you what I would do. <clears throat> nine over e to the n is the same as nine times one over e to the n. So just like I would if this were an integral, I can pop out the nine and rewrite the series like this. And then one divided by e to the n is the same, sorry, the nine still here, n equals one to infinity is the same as one over e all to the power of n. And from here, we can see that the series is geometric. The common ratio is what? What is the common ratio of this geometric series? One over e. One over e, good. So the absolute value of the common ratio is the absolute value of one over e, which is also one over e, which is definitely less than one because e is close to three, which means the series converges. The value of the series, sometimes also called the sum of the series, is going to be the starting term. divided by one minus the common ratio. <clears throat> what is the starting term of the series? What is the very first term of that series? One over e. One over e, right? Because here, the series begins at n equals one. So that very first term is not one, it's one over e to the one. So that's, <clears throat> I'm gonna bring uh, my one over e and then divide it by one minus one over e, which is the same as one over e times e minus one over e, having a common denominator downstairs. And then we can flip and multiply. So this is one over e times e over e minus one. And we cancel those e's. We get one over e minus one. <clears throat> Now we also had this nine here, right? And I popped the nine out. Let me go ahead and say it like this, because this is the piece that we're saying converges. Therefore, sigma nine over e to the n sum from one to infinity is nine times sigma n from one to infinity, one over e all to the n which is nine times one over e minus one, which is nine over e minus one. So that's the first part dealt with. The second part is gonna require a little bit of work with partial fractions. It's one, it's two, sigma n from one to infinity. 
five over n times n plus one, we can do some PFD. So is that what it converges to? It converges to nine over e minus one? Um, so if you have just the one over e to the n series, that converges to one over e minus one. Therefore, the nine over e to the n series, which is nine times the one over e to the n series, converges to nine over e minus one. So this first guy, this guy converges to nine over e minus one, yes. We're setting up my partial fractions for the next one. I could pop the five out or I could leave the five in. Sometimes a constant here helps with the partial fractions. I don't think it matters for this one, but I'll just leave it in. And then I can clear out the denominators. My left hand side is five. My right hand side would then be a times n plus one plus b times n. And if I evaluate that at n equals zero, I get five equals a times one plus zero plus b times zero. So five is equal to a. And if I evaluate that expression at n equals negative one, I have five equals a times zero plus b times negative one, which means negative five is equal to b. So this is the result from my partial fraction decomposition, which tells me that this series is equal to sigma. Now I left the five in with my partial fractions, right? So this is going to be five over n minus five over n plus one. And the trick to handling a series like this, a telescoping series, is to write it out as the limit of its partial sums. So this is limit capital N to infinity, sigma little n from one to capital N of five over N minus five over N plus one. And this should remind you a lot of type one improper integrals where you rewrite the integral from one to infinity as the limit r goes to infinity integral one to r. We're doing exactly the same thing here. Sigma n from one to infinity is the limit as capital N goes to infinity, sigma one to capital N. The reason we do that is because we cannot work directly with this thing, but we can work directly with this thing. So now I'm going to work directly with this thing. I'm going to write it out. When little n is equal to one, I have five over one minus five over two. And then plus, when little n is equal to two, I have five over two minus five over three. When little n is equal to three, I would have, I'll write it as five over three minus five over four. And we'll keep going like this. And I'll write the last few terms as well. The third to last term is when little n is equal to capital N minus two. And that would be five over cap N minus two minus five over cap N minus one. The second to last term is when little n is equal to capital N minus one. So that would be five over cap N minus one minus five over cap N. And the last term is when little n is equal to capital N, that's five over cap N minus five over cap N plus one. I'll index each of these. This is little n equals one, little n equals two, little n equals three, little n equals cap N minus two, little n equals cap N minus one, and little n equals cap N. So here is the full partial sum. 
I'm able to do this because the partial sum is finite in length as opposed to the full sum, which is infinite in length. Now, I can't do much with it in this form regarding the limit. <clears throat> but if I clean things up here, then I can take the limit. And the trick is to just figure out what goes and what stays. This 5 halves and this 5 halves cancel. This negative 5 thirds and positive 5 thirds cancel. What else is obvious? This negative 5 over n minus 1, positive 5 over n minus 1. This negative 5 over n and this positive 5 over n. The pattern is that the negative term, the negative part of a given term, cancels with the positive part of the next term. So this 5 fourths would be canceled by the very first thing we see inside the dot, dot, dots. And this 5 over n minus 2 would be canceled by the very last thing inside the dot, dot, dots. So what we have is 5 over 1, he survives, and minus 5 over capital N plus 1. And as capital N goes to infinity, 5 over capital N plus 1 goes to 0. So this is just 5 over 1, which is 5. Telescoping series are nice because we really do work directly with the definition of the series. This full infinite series by partial fractions is equal to this full infinite series. This full infinite series is, by definition, the limit of its partial sum. So the limit as capital N goes to infinity of the capital Nth partial sum. Then we write out that capital Nth partial sum and cancel everything that cancels. This is why these are called telescoping, because we see this whole big thing go down to this thing, just like those you know, silly cartoon telescopes. Once we have our nice cleaned up version, we can take the limit as capital N goes to infinity there, and we get out a finite value. So let me go ahead and, and finish writing the solution here, and then I'll answer that question. Since the limit of the partial sum exists and is finite, the series we're working with here, sigma n from 1 to infinity, 5 over n times n plus 1, converges. And it converges to 5. All right. So there is a question. Let's go ahead and answer that, and then we'll we'll wrap up this problem. Yeah, I guess. Are 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 like is partial fraction decomposition and like telescoping series like connected, or is that just like a coincidence here? Um, there's nothing inherent about telescoping series that connects it to partial fractions. However, <clears throat> a lot of partial fractions problems do involve, or sorry, a lot of telescoping series do involve partial fractions. It's just the case that if you're trying to come up with a telescoping series, um, the easiest way to do that is to start with something like this. But then the way textbook authors write problems, they don't want to give it to you like this because that's too obvious. So they have a common denominator and put those two terms together, which means we need to do partial fractions to, to undo that. Um, but if you look in the book um, or at the examples we did, the examples we did in class last time, um, you'll see that there are many telescoping series that don't involve any partial fractions. But it is true that oftentimes the telescoping series we will see uh, will involve some partial fractions. So if we come down here, each of the series in 43 through 48 are telescoping series. Um, and you see one, two, three of these are ripe for partial fractions, 43, 45, and 48. To get started on any of those, you'll use partial fractions. 44, however, is also telescoping. 47 is also telescoping. Um, and those don't involve anything like partial fractions. 46, this kind of looks like something you would get out of partial fractions, except we've got these square roots. So they, they couldn't have glued those together and asked you to undo them with PFD because PFD doesn't apply to those. Um, but yeah, I would say at least half of the problems you're going to find in any given calculus book that deal with telescoping series will involve some partial fractions. But there is no inherent connection. 
But what makes a series telescoping is that the partial sum has a lot of cancellation, that you go from having n terms down to having just a few terms. And that's, that's why we call these telescoping. Right. How do we other? know whether to use, um, like how do we know how to approach a problem, whether it's gonna be like um, indeterminate forms or um, telescoping? Well, uh, so this is kind of like, how do I know which method to apply to an integral, right? Should I do trig sub, u sub? Uh, should I do partial fractions? Should I try something else like IBP? How do you know what method to apply to an integral? It has to do with the shape of the integrand, right? So here, when I look at this, I see that this is something I could easily do partial fractions with. So it makes sense to go ahead and do the partial fractions and see how it splits up. And then because it splits up like this, I can see that it will telescope, right? If you write out the first few terms of this series, almost all of them cancel right away. And that's how you know that this is a telescoping series. Uh, similarly, for the first part here, I know to try and treat this 9 over e to the n as a geometric series, because 9 is a constant. I know he can pop out. And 1 over e to the n is the same as 1 over e all to the n. So it has to do with kind of looking at the thing inside the series and thinking about it the same way you think about integrals. <clears throat> um, you know, does this look like something that I've used a technique on in the past? So it kind of comes from experience. I'll say that if you have some constant raised to the n and nothing else going on, um, then that's definitely a geometric series and, that, and that's how you should approach it. If you have a rational function of n inside your series, like here, a ratio of two polynomials and the bottom factors nicely, then that's something you should at least try the PFD on and see if it, it ends up looking like a telescoping series. Later, we're going to develop a lot more tests. So the, the other question was uh, L'Hopital's rule or indeterminate forms. Um, that is the technique we used when we applied the test for divergence. And the test for divergence is something that I generally recommend running in your head right away. So when I look at this series, I ask myself, do the general terms, do the ANs here go to zero? Uh, and right away I see yes, because e to the n gets huge. So nine over e to the n goes to zero. n times n plus one, that goes to infinity. So five over that goes to zero. So running TFD in your head is a good idea. And then if that limit is either difficult to calculate or you can see readily that that limit is not zero, then you go ahead and write down the actual steps for TFD, uh, test for divergence. Um, regarding when to use L'Hopital's rule, uh, certainly you only ever use L'Hopital's rule when you're working with a limit. And so far, the only convergence test we have that involves working with a limit is the test for divergence. So if you're looking at a limit and you get an indeterminate form, then you should apply L'Hopital's rule or attempt to apply L'Hopital's rule. Um, but largely, it's going to come from experience. You have to solve a lot of problems just like with integrals. <clears throat> OK, we're not quite done with this problem yet. So I would finish this up by saying, both sigma n equals 1 to infinity 9 over e to the n and sigma n equals 1 to infinity 5 over n times n plus 1 converge. So the original series s must converge, right? A convergent series plus a convergent series will always be a convergent series, because when you add two finite things, you always get a finite thing. Moreover, S, my original series, is the sum of these two. Sigma n from 1 to infinity, 9 over e to the n plus sigma n from 1 to infinity, 5 over n times n plus 1, which is equal to 9 over e minus 1 plus 5. So that is the sum of the whole series. 
and I, I stated a rule there that I'd like to make explicit. <clears throat> it says a fact. Um, if S1 and S2 both converge, then so does its sum, S1 plus S2. If one of S1 S2 converges and the other diverges, what do you think is true? Then S1 plus S2, if one of these is convergent and the other one is divergent, what do you think is true of their sum? The sum diverges as well? Diverges. Good, must diverge, right? Because if you take something finite and add it to something infinite, you'll necessarily get something infinite. So this would necessarily be divergent. Or we would say it diverges. Here's the fun one. If both S1 and S2 diverge, then S1 plus S2, any ideas? I mean, I would say diverge, but obviously not. Maybe, um, I don't know if it's <laughs> indeterminate. Yeah, this could go either way. Now, if both series, S1 and S2, have only positive terms, then the sum of two divergent series will diverge. But imagine S1 is divergent and S2 is the negative version of S1, which is also divergent then. Well, then when I add them up, the terms will term for term cancel. So you would get a convergent series, you would get zero. So it is possible that if this guy cancels out some of the terms from this guy, then they could both diverge, but have a sum together, which converges. And the obvious way to do that is to look at this one being a divergent geometric series, and this one being the negative version of that same divergent geometric series. When you put them together, term for term, they will cancel. So you have two divergent series that add up to a convergent series, which is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, but again, if, if they're both positive terms only, then the sum would automatically diverge. Uh, but this is, this is one of those sort of tricky test questions that people, uh, <clears throat> your intuition can, can get the better of you there. But the most important results here are these two. These are the ones that we use a lot. So convergent plus convergent is convergent. Convergent plus divergent is divergent. If they both diverge, could go either way. <clears throat> All right. If I'm working on a problem and I find out that S1 diverges, I still have to follow up with S2? That's correct. Yeah, because if S2 also diverges, then it could go either way, unless they're both positive term series. So right, if this was like um, e to the n over 9 instead of 9 over e to the n, and this was the same thing that it is now, e to the n over nine and five over n times n plus one, those are both series whose terms are all positive. So I could say that the sum would diverge after I show that this guy diverges, but you would have to make that, that observation. So I'll put, a, I'll put a little asterisk here and say, however, if S1 and S2 are both divergent and have only positive terms. Then S1 plus S2 will diverge.
right? So the idea there is that positive infinity plus negative infinity is an indeterminate form, but positive infinity plus positive infinity is definitely just positive infinity. Okay. <clears throat> is there anything else from the homework? either this week's homework or older ones that you guys are worried about and you're, you're feeling uncomfortable with in any way. Anything since exam one? Uh, number 11 on the homework looks weird. It just has a homework. LN. Okay, let's see. Number 11 on the current homework set. Uh, test two is still a good ways away. So I got a, a PM asking uh, when, is, when is test two. Test two is still a good ways away. We have to get through 11.8 before test two. 11.7, uh, 11 11.8, 11 right around there. Um, so two weeks-ish. Um, yeah, Any so here they've given us a hint. They say by expressing the nth partial sum as in example eight, and example eight was this telescoping series. So they're giving us a hint here. They're saying this thing is a telescoping series, but it doesn't look like a telescoping series, does it? It doesn't look like any of the telescoping series we've seen so far. So I'm just going to say investigate series S equals sigma nine natural log, what was it? N plus one over N, N over N plus one sums from one. Does anybody have an idea as how to get started here? Definitely not going to do partial fractions, right? That natural log term, this is not a rational function. Um, first thing I would do is pop out the constant 9. Very good. So 9 can come out. And what's left is sigma n from 1 to infinity, natural log of n over n plus 1. Who here loves logarithms? It's a love-hate relationship. Okay. That's 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 okay. Um, remember that the natural log, any log really, of a product is the ln of the first thing plus the ln of the second thing. So logs turn multiplication inside to addition outside. There's a corresponding rule for division. The natural log of a ratio, A over B, is the natural log of the top minus the natural log of the bottom. These are some of the rules for logarithms that we're supposed to hammer in really hard in pre-calc. So my series. can be rewritten as nine times sigma n from one to infinity, natural log of n minus the natural log of n plus one. Now that does look like a telescoping series, right? The first few terms here would be log one minus log two plus log two minus log three plus log three minus log four. The negative from each guy cancels the positive from the previous guy. So this now I can see as telescoping. And even if I didn't see that, the problem gives me the hint to write out the partial sum. So the full series is the limit as capital N goes to infinity of the nth partial sum. And the nine can come all the way out front of the limit because it is a constant. 
And then in my next step, I write out that partial sum. So this is nine lim capital N to infinity. The little n equals one term is ln one minus ln two. The little n equals two term is ln two minus ln three. The second to last term is natural log of n minus one minus natural log of n, capital N. And the very last term is the natural log of capital N minus the natural log of capital N plus one. So here's my capital nth partial sum all written out. And there is a boatload of cancellation here, right? The ln twos go, the ln of capital Ns go. And the pattern is that the negative part of a given term cancels with the positive part of the next. So this natural log of three is gonna get eaten up by the first thing in there. This positive natural log of N minus one is gonna get eaten up by the negative part of the last term in there. And what we end up with is the natural log of one minus the natural log of n plus one. So this is nine times the limit as capital N goes to infinity of, ln of one is zero, but I'll go ahead and write it, minus the natural log of capital N plus one. At the stage I'll say, okay, I know that's zero. What does the natural log of n plus one do as n plus one, or as n goes to infinity? What is the natural log of infinity? Infinity. Very good. The natural log function is unbounded. It grows without bound. It grows very slowly, but it grows without bound. So this is nine times, there's a negative here. So I'd say negative infinity, which is definitely negative infinity. So the series, S diverges by definition, right? The series is by definition, the limit of the sequence of partial sums. And we showed that those partial sums go off to negative infinity. This is another one that might be fun to look at in Desmos. I'll give you a second to get everything clear here. There was a request in chat to look a little more closely at the test for divergence. Um, we, can, we can maybe do one more problem like that. Um, I do want to introduce, ooh, we're actually, we're out of time, aren't we? 1043, yeah. All right, uh, then that's, that's okay. We can hang our hat here for today. Uh, we are slipping a little bit behind, but I'm okay with that because I really do want you guys to understand this. Those of you who are going into any sort of hard science, engineering, anything like that, um, you'll see that series are probably the most important part of the entire calculus sequence. Um, chemistry, physics, any flavor of engineering, certainly if you're going to go into mathematics, um, these are foundational objects. So it's important to take the time here. On Monday, we're going to move into section 11.3, which is where we're going to meet our very first new convergence test. Uh, that, that convergence test will be the second proper convergence test we have. The first one is the test for divergence. Um, and it's called the integral test. So it's, it's a place where uh, you compare uh, an infinite series to the related type one improper integral. And there's one result from that that I have to share with you so you can finish the homework. One thing that I, I wanted to talk about today that I, I must tell you. Um, so fact, your book shows this in 11.2, but their argument I do not like. Um, the series sigma n from one to infinity of one over n, one plus one half, plus one third, plus one fourth, this thing diverges. It's called the harmonic series. 
has a name. And the harmonic series diverges. So that's what I was kind of hinting at with that Desmos stuff, that uh, 1 over n, when you sum from 1 to infinity, diverges. Um, the easiest way to see this is by comparing it to the integral, integral 1 to infinity, 1 over x dx, which will diverge. That's an improper integral that you can compute. And that's what we're going to start with on Monday of next week. Um, but this is something that you need for that last requested problem. Which one was it? This guy. So this is an example of a series you can split up. The first piece is geometric. The second piece, after you pop out the five, is this. And I'll show you why this diverges on Monday. If you want to, you can take a look at the book's proof. They use an inequality. And technically, what they're doing there is a comparison test, which, which we have not technically learned yet. Um, so I don't, I don't like this argument because it is uh, kind of leaning on stuff that we don't know yet. But, um, but I'll just tell you that this is the case, right? This is a divergent series. And I'll give you a proof on Monday that is more digestible than the book's proof. All right, so next week, 11.3 on the integral test and 11.4 on the comparison test. Those are both uh, somewhat tricky sections. And then we're going to move forwards. Uh, we'll have 11.5 on alternating series, 11.6 on the root and ratio tests, and 11.7, which is kind of like 7.5. It's strategies for testing series. So just like 7.5 with strategies for integration, where you put together all the stuff from earlier in chapter 7, 11.7 is the place where you put together all the stuff from earlier in chapter 11. Um, I encourage you to read ahead. And I also encourage you to solve extra problems from 11.1 and 11.2. Remember what I said last time. The homework I give you is the bare minimum. Um, and if you want to get good at this stuff, you must solve lots of problems. The thing I used to do, I used to give just straight up optional homework right out of the book. I didn't collect or grade any homework. I suggested a handful of problems. Um, and then I told you, you're on your own. Just solve as many as you can. And if you need help with any of them, come see me. Uh, the department didn't like that because this math department kind of doesn't treat you guys like grown-ups and won't let me treat you guys like grown-ups. Um, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with graded homework. But uh, please take the time to be strong and independent here. Study some extra problems. Um, clicking through the homework and just saying converge, diverge until you get the right answer is not going to teach you anything. Uh, what will teach you stuff is practicing with the tests and most importantly, talking with other people about it. This isn't like previous math classes where studying on your own is um, the best way to go. Here, I think studying with one other person is the best way to go. Um, because you want to be checking your logic. You want to see if you can explain what's going on to somebody else. The Discord is a great place to do that, um, or office hours, of course. All right, I got to run, so we're going to end it here for the day. Uh, I hope you guys do have a good rest of your day, a nice, safe, and happy weekend. Please read 11.3. Make sure you finish the homework online, and um, take a look at some extra problems from 11.1 and 11.2. I think that will be really beneficial for you guys. Um, that's it for me. I'll see you all on Monday.